So the fight that we are fighting right now is to bring our people together, working people and young people, people of color, to fight for a society where government and the economy works for all and not just the few. Thank you all very much uh, for being here this evening. Uh, I hope you will find it uh, informational and useful, and I hope you read the book, because it's a good book. <laughs> um, let me talk a little bit about some of the policy issues uh, that I wrestle with every day as a member of the United States Senate, and then I want to talk about some of the political issues and how I think we can move forward to a more humane and decent world. Uh, what I discovered uh, in running for President of the United States is that in my country, there was much more dissatisfaction with the status quo and the political establishment than people had perceived. In other words, people had thought, well, things are going OK. It turns out that for tens of millions of people, things were not going OK and that people wanted change. And if you ask me the great challenge that we face in this moment, it is that change is going to come. And the question is, in America, and I think in many other parts of the world, what will that change look like? Will it be a change in which we create a more vibrant democratic society? Will it be a change in which we move toward more power for working people? Will it be a change in which we wipe out vestiges, all vestiges of racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia? Will it be a change which brings people together to create a common humanity? Or on the other hand, will it be the change that moves us toward autocracy, more and more war, where countries are divided by where people came from or the color of their skin or their sexual orientation. Change is going to come. There is massive dissatisfaction with the establishment and the status quo in America. And I believe that is true in many other parts of the world. So the fight that we are fighting right now is to bring our people together, working people and young people, people of color, to fight for a society where government and the economy works for all and not just the few. Now, what are the issues that we deal with and how, does, how do these issues relate to our politics? Number one, to my mind, the existential, and I don't use that word lightly, the existential threat that we face is climate change. And that is, and the difficulty of that issue is, is that if Holland does the right thing, it's great. And if Europe does the right thing, it is great. And if the United States does the right thing, it's great. But we need to fight climate change, international cooperation. We are in the same boat. And what I worry about right now is that there are forces in the United States and in China. China is now the world's largest carbon emitter. And they are doing some good things in terms of sustainable energy, but they're also doing a lot with coal. If we don't bring the world together, we are not going to address the climate crisis. So climate is not just a Dutch issue or an American issue. It is an international issue. And whether or not we will succeed will very much relate to the kind of world we leave our children and future generations. Now, what we do in that book is talk about issues that, at least in American society, and I, I suspect in Europe as well, are not talked about a whole lot. And when we talk about politics, we talk about power. Who has the power? Who makes decisions? And the truth is that in my society, not to be talked about at all, not in the corporate media, uh, not in the halls of our Congress, is the fact that we are rapidly moving toward an oligarchic form of society. You all know what I mean by that. 
What oligarchy means is that you have a small number of incredibly wealthy and powerful people who make the key decisions as to what happens in our economy uh, and in our political life. So in America now, and again, we don't talk about it very often for obvious reasons, but in the United States now, we have more income and wealth inequality than we have ever had in the history of America. And that manifests itself with three people, multi-billionaires, owning more wealth than the bottom half of American society. In America today, while the very, very rich are becoming much richer, there has been a massive transfer of wealth over the last 30, 40 years from the 90% to the 1%. In America today, 60%, 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. I don't, is that a term you're familiar with here? All right, that means you get paid and you got nothing to save. You gotta use your check just to pay the bills. And there are studies out there. Tens of millions of Americans, if they had their car broke down and you needed to spend $500 to repair the car, that would be a financial disaster for that family. They don't have the $500. So what we have is a growing gap between the very rich and the very and the middle class, a sinking middle class. And that wealth and income inequality then manifests itself in political inequality, which means that in America, not in most countries in Europe, but in the United States, if you are a billionaire, you can spend hundreds of millions of dollars in a political campaign. Got that? What you do is start up what we call a super political action committee, super PAC. And you take a check, you put several hundred million dollars, and with those hundreds of millions of dollars, you can influence races all over the country. So you have not only an economic oligarchy, but incredible power of the 1% over the political process. So when people ask me, why, doesn't, why don't we see progressive legislation in the US Congress that is certainly a major factor. People have to work very hard to get campaign contributions, and they come from very wealthy people, and instead of representing the working class or lower income people, uh, they are busy representing corporate interests. Another key issue that we wrestle with uh, every day, and you know, I, I certainly would not have said this to you if I were here uh, 10 years ago, but that is the future of democracy in America. And it's certainly not only in the United States. You know, democracy is a reasonably new phenomenon. Uh, 120 years ago here in Europe, you had people ruling this divine rights. God gave them the right to have all the wealth and all the power. And some revolutions changed that. But right now in America and in many parts of the world, democracy is in trouble and on the defense. And we can discuss why that is so. But I think for many lower income and working class people, they look at their lives in the United States, they can't afford health care. they are working for very low wages, they can't afford housing, they worry very much about the future for their children. And in certain parts of America, the situation is so bad, I don't know how much it is known here in Europe, but our life expectancy how long we live as a people is actually in decline. So the United States has for a very long time lagged behind other developed countries in terms of how long we live. But right now, our life expectancy in certain parts of the country is actually declining. And that has a lot to do with what we call diseases of despair. And that is a, 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 a phrase developed by some doctors. And what they are saying is that many people are giving up literally on life. And they're turning to drugs. And we lost, if you can believe it, in America, 100,000 people last year to drug overdoses. Uh, they're turning to alcohol. Uh, they are turning to uh, food and becoming obese. And they're turning to suicide. And the result of all of these factors is that life expectancy in the United States is actually in decline. So something that should be on all of our minds is how do we create a vibrant democracy? What 
does a vibrant democracy look like? Uh, why is government not representing the very pressing needs of working families? I'll give you one other example. It's not just income and wealth inequality, and it is in America uh, not just the fact that 60% of our people live paycheck to paycheck or some 500,000 people are homeless. Today, the weekly wage, weekly wage for the average American worker, despite huge increases in automation and technology, is lower than it was 50 years ago. You got that? So today, in real inflation-adjusted dollars, the income, the weekly earnings of an average American worker is less than it was 50 years ago. So you ask why people get distressed, why they're angry, why they're in despair, is that despite the fact that workers are now hundreds of times more productive than they were 50 years ago, they're actually earning less money. So what are we trying to do about all of these things, among many other issues? Uh, what we are trying to do is put together a progressive movement in America, which is multi-generational, uh, which is multi-racial, uh, which is trying to bring together uh, people from all over this country uh, to stand up and aggressively fight for economic justice, for social justice, for racial justice, and for a world uh, of peace. And we have had some rather extraordinary successes. I don't, it's not widely reported here, either in the United States or here. But right now, in the US House of Representatives, over the last eight years, uh, we have elected dozens and dozens of very strong, mostly young, often people of color, progressives. People who are prepared to stand up to the 1%, stand up to corporate greed, stand up to racism. And in fact, within the Democratic caucus of the House of Representatives, there have never been, never ever been, as many strong progressives as we have today. Not necessarily the case in the Senate, but it is the case in the House. We are also winning seats in state legislatures around the country uh, and in uh, city councils. That's the good news. The bad news is the right wing is also growing in support. And if you ask me who the next president of the United States is going to be, I would say at this point, I really don't know. It certainly could be Trump. It certainly could be Biden. I think a little bit more likely that it will be Biden, but not by a long shot. So what our job is in the next year is to rally the American people around a progressive agenda, which among other things means tackling income and wealth inequality, creating a political system which is based on one person, one vote, not how much money you have, deals with addressing the crisis of climate and creating millions of jobs in sustainable energy. So that is what we are struggling to do. And of course, these are not just American issues, they're global issues. And I will say to you that the times are very, very serious. And uh, I hesitate uh, to wager a, a, a guess as to what this world will be like if we are not successful. So we're in this together. Uh, let us go forward and let us create the kind of uh, society that uh, I think we can and should be creating. Thank you very much.